This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. In the opening pages of the Communist Manifesto, 19th century philosopher Karl Marx said, Socialism is when no iPhone. Nearly two centuries later, the inscrutable genius of these words can finally be scruted. If you've ever wanted to learn about socialism, there's a good chance you've heard some version of this take before. You've probably been told something along the lines of, socialism does sound good in theory, but in practice, without the guiding hand of the profit motive, there would simply be no incentive to innovate. Sure, capitalism may have its flaws, but hey, at least it's good at innovating, and in the long run, that means most things will eventually be solved by the market. Socialism, on the other hand, means saying bye-bye to innovation. No innovation means no iPhone, and suddenly it's back to playing Brick Breaker on your mom's Blackberry. You'd think that with such a simple yet crushing argument, there'd be no socialist to speak of. No countries run by communist parties. No postmodern cultural neo-Marxist taking over college campuses. No old men with magic bird powers. But the reality is that innovation is not only consistently stifled under capitalism, there is no reason to think it wouldn't flourish under socialism. In fact, there's plenty of evidence that it would. But before we get to that, let's briefly touch on innovation under our current system. No one disputes that capitalism has seen the birth of many, many discoveries. But a lot of that is at best only tangentially related to our current mode of production. Capitalist innovation is just not all that it's cracked up to be. And speaking of cracked, take the iPhone, the example of choice for those who defend our current economic model. The story goes that Steve Jobs, luminary genius that he was, built Apple from the back of his garage to the front stage of America, producing innovation after innovation along the way. The fruit of his labor and superior intellect, along with his keen ability to respond to the demands of the market, produced the device you're probably watching this video on. Or so they'll say. To reject capitalism is therefore to reject this miracle of technology in your hand, and even so much as thinking to advocate for socialism on an Apple device makes you a hypocrite ripe for an Elon Musk Twitter takedown. Capitalism made your iPhone. You should be grateful and learn not to bite the hand that feeds you. But that perspective couldn't be further from reality. Not only did capitalism not make your iPhone, almost every single component that makes it a smartphone actually comes from state-directed innovation. Microprocessors, memory chips, solid-state hard drives, liquid crystal displays, lithium batteries, touchscreens, all of these were not invented by profit-seeking capitalists battling it out in the marketplace, but thanks to the funding and or direct involvement of governments in the creative process. Same goes for the GPS, voice recognition software, cell networks, and HTTP and HTML protocols that together make an iPhone an iPhone. All of these things exist thanks to the innovation that happened without price signals, without market competition, and most importantly, without private capital. But that's not all. The internet itself, the most important thing that makes the smartphone smart and more than just a metal rectangle with pretty colors, is the fruit of government innovation. The internet is arguably one of, if not the most life-changing innovation in the history of humanity. And governments are so good at innovating that they stumbled on the formula for it at least twice. Markets may have capitalized on these innovations, but that just doesn't count as innovation in and of itself. Selling something isn't the same as coming up with it. The reality of this device is that it took the concerted efforts of a public research apparatus to make the iPhone possible, not the self-interested greed of a few profiteers. And while the iPhone is a great example of this fact, it's by no means unique. This same story is repeated all throughout our society, including on much more important things than our Twitter machines. Most crucially, our medical industry is entirely reliant on the ability of the public sector to innovate. One study found that NIH funding was associated directly or indirectly with every drug approved from 2010 to 2016. Without publicly funded research, aka not the kind that follows market fluctuations, we wouldn't have made nearly all the medical advancements we have or saved nearly as many lives. These are not innovations that make public researchers multimillionaires, nor that have a good ROI, and yet they are the bedrock of our modern health system. Some innovations that support the capitalist economy even come from completely voluntary, non-government funded, and entirely unpaid work done by brilliant people who just wanted to do something one day and did. Companies like Facebook, Airbnb, and Netflix all rely on thousands and thousands of lines of open source code, published freely and with no expectation of compensation by random, passionate programmers. 
these companies are so dependent on this free, voluntary, very uncapitalist code that back in 2016, an open source programmer unpublished just 11 lines of code, and most major websites you can think of just started crashing. But it's not just that many of capitalism's so-called innovations aren't even the fruit of capitalist forces. There's a whole other, more problematic side to our modern economy. Capitalism actively hinders innovation. There are a couple reasons behind this, but for starters, capitalism naturally tends towards monopolies. It's just what happens in a winner-takes-all competition. Eventually, the winners do take all, and they consolidate or form cartels. In the absence of competition, large industries can reliably secure profits without needing to do very much beyond periodically making small improvements to their products. With that one sentence, I've just described to you the entire innovation strategy behind every Apple product. And don't get mad, I say that as an Apple guy. The reality is that if the only motivation for innovation is profit, and that truly is the only one capitalism has to offer, once you take that variable out of the equation, there is no reason to innovate anymore. But even in the fantasy world defenders of capitalism live in, where monopolies do not naturally come to dominate the economy, capitalism is still rife with problems that make innovation grind to a halt. Generally speaking, capitalism only promotes and actively incentivizes innovation that turns a profit. Any innovation, no matter how grand, no matter how many millions of lives it could save, only sees the light of day if it can provide a good return on investment. If something is good for a very large number of people, but they all happen to be poor, too bad. It's just not gonna happen. But that's just a hypothetical example. It's not like you have to be poor for this logic to apply to you. We can actually see very concrete examples of this kind of thing making everyone's life just a little bit worse. For example, instead of finding ways to make the most durable, long-lasting battery humanly possible, every phone and laptop manufacturer makes batteries that can't handle more than a few years of regular use. While I'm sure there are technical problems that make that difficult, manufacturers would be putting a lot more effort into solving that puzzle if it wasn't so profitable to have bad batteries you'll need to replace with a new purchase every couple of years. What incentive does Apple have to sell you one iPhone when it could sell you five? Capitalism does not reward those who produce the best products, it rewards those that produce the cheapest and most profitable stuff, regardless if it achieves that with a worse product or dirt poor wages. But it doesn't end there. Another big failure of the capitalist model of innovation is the conflict over information. In the quest to find new ways to compete, capitalists are happy to shoot themselves in the foot and take our society along with them so long as it means they keep the upper hand over their competitors. Relative profits matter a lot more than absolute profits. So what's bad for the industry is only a problem if it upsets its internal power dynamics. In theory, every firm should normally benefit from a database cataloging the discoveries made by everyone else in their search for new innovations allowing everyone to build on the discoveries others make. If being the most innovative we can be is the goal, there's no reason to have secrets that someone else could use to make something you care about even better. But every firm knows that sharing its proprietary information could hurt its bottom line, even though the outcome for customers would be a better product. It's better to sit on a discovery you don't know how to harness yet and might never figure out, than to let your competitor swoop in and get there before you. Even though we would all benefit from innovation happening faster, and letting information find the person who's going to utilize it best, capitalism is incredibly inefficient when it comes to doing so just because it's a safer way to make money. Despite capitalists always referring to the so-called free market, information has no freedom of movement, and it gets heavily restricted to avoid hurting each individual firm's bottom line. Patents are some of the more extreme examples of this kind of restricted flow of information, and we can see how dramatic these consequences can be beyond just hurting innovation. For example, one of the big reasons that the COVID pandemic is still raging on and that new variants keep appearing regularly is because of patents. Patents are preventing vaccines from being manufactured cheaply and made widely available. This matters because sharing this vital information on how to produce a life-saving medication would allow entire continents, most notably Africa, to lower a still very high COVID death toll. Not only that, allowing the virus to propagate and find new hosts, which is what keeping vaccine patents behind closed doors is doing, increases the chances of a more infectious or deadly mutation appearing. It is in our collective interest for information to flow freely, but it's not in the interest of profits, so it just doesn't happen. But enough about capitalism. Now let's see how innovation fares under socialism and what incentives motivate. 
For starters, under socialism, the profit motive is virtually eliminated through any of a number of processes, be it central planning, free association, and or the general elimination of private capital. As we've already seen, this means there is no longer a need to satisfy both the need for usefulness and the need for profit when innovating. Only the most important one matters. Innovation doesn't need to be profitable to be worthwhile, and that already solves a lot of problems. This can also make socialist economies incredibly risk-seeking, contrary to what you'll often hear. Funding a project that doesn't necessarily need to return an immediate profit means casting a much wider net and therefore catching a lot more unique fish. Capitalists will often tell you that risk is their bread and butter, but the reality is that capitalists are relatively conservative when it comes to investing in risky projects, since the cost of failure can be so high. But we can actually go a lot further than just eliminating the profit motive. Part of the socialist program is to grant freely and to everybody the basic necessities of life, housing, food, and healthcare being some of the most important of these needs. Under our current economic model, someone who is lacking any of these is forced to spend the great majority of their time working, not necessarily in a way that has anything to do with their skills, just to stay alive. Only an infinitely lucky few will ever have the opportunity to showcase their talent as part of their job. And so an insane amount of innovative capacity just goes completely to waste. It's truly mind-boggling to imagine how many people just as smart as Einstein spend their entire lives just barely scraping by and toiling away to have their basic needs met instead of having the freedom to put their genius to work. But even that barely scratches the surface. Socialists also expect and advocate for extending education, particularly higher education, to all who wish to pursue it. In our current system, of course, this is a luxury only afforded to the wealthy or those willing to take on the massive burden of student loans. Back in 2010, the latest year with available data, only 6.7% of the world had a college degree. Think of how many billions of people could have their skills and talents developed by access to higher education, and the kinds of things they would come up with that would benefit us all. But it's not profitable to make education freely accessible, so I guess never mind. And that's not all. Since one of the main driving forces of socialism is reducing the time spent working, there is also a considerable incentive to innovate in ways that can automate labor. While capitalists give lip service to their own version of this argument, saying they'll replace all of us with robots one day to save money, they'll often find that it's cheaper to export labor to a poor country than it is to actually develop the technology that would replace a domestic worker. In other words, we keep working just as much and for less money, Ultimately, this kind of innovation gets stifled under capitalism, but has no reason not to flourish in a socialist economy where people's well-being takes a precedent on profitability. Automating work is a top priority, and this would be reflected in our innovations. This philosophy also has the added benefit of giving more time for people to quote-unquote waste time, time not spent working and being lazy in the positive sense of the word, something which we all know makes us more effective workers anyway. Leisure time is a critical part of well-being, but we can focus on concrete examples if you prefer to see how the socialist model works in action. Over the past century, the world has seen multiple socialist projects. While there is a lot to say about them, one thing that these experiments proved beyond a shadow of a doubt is that innovation can flourish even when people are not motivated by profit. The USSR gave the world the anthrax vaccine, artificial satellites, and one of the earliest mobile phones. Cuba, despite a brutal American embargo cutting it off from virtually every country in the world, has produced all these biotech innovations, including a vaccine that can stop the spread of lung cancer cells. And these are just the shiny, high-profile examples. A friend has an old Soviet hairdryer that's still working just as well as the day it was produced 40 years ago. Little things like product longevity go a long way towards reducing waste and resource consumption. These societies didn't perfect innovation by any means. There are ways in which their methods have their own problems. But they prove that the weaknesses of the capitalist model can be overcome. Not only that, the kinds of creative friction they faced were much more implementational than structural, the way that innovation gets stifled under capitalism. These issues stem from how we create socialism rather than the rules that bind it, contrary to the way that the profit motive is central to capitalism. At the end of the day, the reality is that innovation isn't the product of one ism or another. Every innovation and every person behind it is the product of a long series of events and influences. Years of public schooling and libraries and web pages full of giants with shoulders to stand on. It's never the product of an individual genius operating alone, much less the fruit of so-called free markets, and much more often the outcome of incremental improvements made by thousands of people over time. 
normal people trying to make their lives just that little bit easier stumble upon the building blocks for the next person to do the same, every single day. And there is nothing about capitalist markets that make them good at incentivizing this. It's all just people. There's no need to have private property for innovation. It's just what people do. Isms do not create things. Workers do. Isms only decide who gets paid. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. As you can probably imagine, YouTube doesn't like to promote left-wing political content. I've gotten a lot of reports recently of people not getting notified of my new videos, even if they have the bell clicked. Because of this, I'm having to rely more heavily on viewers like you to maintain my channel. If you like the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. It's a really fun place to hang out. We have everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to special channels for our neurodivergent and LGBT comrades. I also try to do a live Q&A with patrons every month, which is always a good time. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. So if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.